This isn't Alan's fault. My microphone is not turned on, nor is it hooked up, so I'll have to get that fixed here real quick. Sorry about that. We indeed serve an almighty, faithful, glorious God. The Bible says His mercies are new every morning. And we gather this morning in the new mercies of the Lord to sing His praise, to worship, to fellowship together. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Let's take just a moment. We'll stand, we'll greet each other, and we'll begin very shortly.
we're so grateful that you're a part of this worship service this morning. And I pray that we'll begin not only having sung these beautiful songs, but asking the Lord to speak to our hearts and meet our needs and minister to us. And like Isaiah, may we leave saying, Lord, here am I. Send me. Here am I. Use me for your glory. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for these who have come out to God's house on a cold winter day. Thank you for their faithfulness, and I pray you'll especially bless them. Bless our sweet guests as they have come to worship with us today. And for every need, we know there's a heavenly supply. And Lord, I, even as I have already been, uh, met and shared and, and talked with folks this morning, Lord, I'm aware that we all come with different needs and different hurts and different struggles. And thank you that you're the God of peace. And you're the God of comfort. You're the God of mercy. You're the God of forgiveness and hope and joy. We pray that today that if there's anybody here who's not yet discovered those great riches, that they'll discover them through Christ before they leave today. If there's any believer here today that's going through a valley or any, any believer that's struggling with life's, life's difficulties, may they leave here realizing we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And now, Lord, speak to our hearts. Give us ears to hear. And like Isaiah, we do say simply, Lord, here we are. Send us to do your bidding. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And thank you. Would you please be seated? Take a deep breath, would you please? I'd like to hear back from you. Good morning. <laughs> oh, it's good to see you. And I want to tell you, I believe there'll be a special reward in heaven for people to come to church when it's 19, 20 degrees outside on Sunday morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we have guests today. Please, church family, be aware there are guests and, and make it your responsibility to welcome them personally and make sure they feel like that uh, we are honored as they are. We're honored to have them in our service today. <clears throat> today is a very special day because it's a changing of the guard day, if you will. Years ago, sweet Libby and I, and Libby didn't have an opportunity to go. I went and to Zambia, Africa on a mission trip and stopped in London for a day and stayed all day long and saw the changing of the guard at uh, London, at the uh, London, and saw Big Ben and all those wonderful sights in, in London. But you know, today's a changing of the guard because uh, we have some of those wonderful <clears throat> men in our church who have served and are serving as deacons who are rotating off. We have a three-year rotation, and they'll be rotating off after today. And we have some other men that are coming on that you have elected to serve. The following men uh, have served and are rotating off, and I want us to take a moment and acknowledge them. And if you're one of those men that I call your name, would you and would your spouse, if she's with you today, would you please stand? Myron and Karen Chenault. Myron was back there counting money a while ago. And so Myron, if you can hear me, just keep counting money. Uh, and we thank the Lord for you. Howard and Kim Dollum. Are Howard and Kim with us this morning? Howard? All right, go ahead and stand up, would you, buddy? Miss Kim? Is Miss Kim anywhere nearby? <laughs> to be with her. We're glad that you're here. And just remain standing, Howard, Darren, Newberry, and Lisa. Thank the Lord for these sweet folks, Gary Smith and Cindy. Gary, is Gary back at the soundboard today? There, there, Gary, step inside the door, would you there? Would you please? Myron, uh, do I see Myron back there? Step inside the door there, Myron, would you please? Myron, is Karen with you today? Okay, not feeling well. Uh, and Dave and Amy Whitten. And Amy, I, oh, lost so many people are sick. Uh, I want you to join me. First of all, let me say, 
As a pastor of 40 some odd years and having served a number of churches, I can honestly say I have never served with a more godly group of men who love their pastor and their staff anymore. A more faithful group of, pastor, of deacon's wives who have served the Lord alongside these men faithfully and you have served your church faithfully for these last three years. Dave has been an outstanding chairman. Would you join me in saying to these and to all of our deacons, thank you for your service. Would you give them a big hand, please? Thank you. You may be seated. You may feel like that you're getting a reprieve after today. Congratulations. I'd like to ask the following gentlemen, if you would please, I'd like to ask you and your wife, if your wife is with you, to come and stand right here along the front. We would like not only to recognize you, but like to formally, with a time of prayer, install you officially to serve for the next three year term. Some of these men have served before. In fact, all of them, uh, except Gene Marsh, have served here before. Gene has served elsewhere. This will be his first time coming on here. So Randy Hayes and Nancy, would y'all come and stand here at the front? Gene and Linda Marsh, they're in the back somewhere. Y'all come and <clears throat> sweet members of our pastor's class and Randy and Nancy have been so faithful to our church for so long. Stephen and Anna McCollum, what a delight to uh, have Stephen coming back on our deacon body. And these, this precious, precious couple is such a blessing to our church. Ricky and Karen Millwood, Karen and Ricky, I think are in the choir. I'll give you a little extra time. Take your time. Be careful. Love these sweet folks. Larry Monk and Marita. Larry served a number of years as deacon and is coming back on our deacon body. And we're grateful for them. <clears throat> and the other David Whitten, Papa Dave and Susan, Big Dave. Y'all come and stand here, would you please? And little Dave, I want you to come up here, would you please? David, could we find him a microphone? Right here, okay. I want, I want us to pray for these and I want our outgoing chairman uh, to come and join me here. And I want you in a moment, if you would please, to pray for these as they're being installed. Through the almost nine years I've served as your pastor, one of the great, great blessings has been having the, some, like I said, some of the finest men to serve as deacons alongside their wives. And I want to say thank you for your willingness to serve. Your pastor loves you and thanks the Lord for you. Your church family loves you and thanks the Lord for you. And I want us to pray God's blessings on these men. So Dave Whitten, our outgoing chairman, would you pray for us, brother? Lord, I just come here today to uh, thank you for our church. Thank you for the opportunity that you give us to serve here. Most of all, thank you for these men who have agreed to serve as deacons at Central Park Baptist Church. It's a humbling role, Lord. It's a servant role. Uh, I just pray that you would give them the wisdom and the strength and health to uh, fulfill your will in, in uh, filling this uh, important job for the church, Lord. Just pray for their wives, their families, that they would uh, be able to support them in this effort. And uh, just bless our church, bless them as they minister to the congregation. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. And all of God's people said, amen. Let's give these a big hand, would you please? Thank you. You may return to your seats. Thank you so very much. And Dave, thank you. Every pastor <clears throat> ought to be blessed like I have been blessed with these wonderful servants of the Lord and their families. Pray for them. Indeed, they are servants. They recognize that their ministry is not one of management, but one of ministry. And they are wise, they are godly, they are faithful, and they are friends to their pastor. And I thank the Lord for them, encourage them often, pray for them often. Dave, we've got a lot of announcements, but we're not going to make them now. Pardon? Oh yeah, let me, let, me, let me do mention that. Thank you for reminding me because it is so important. On the inside, 
of your bulletin somewhere. Here it is. As you open it up, all the way on your left hand, on your right hand side, you'll see at the bottom of the page the Committee Appreciation Luncheon. If you have been asked to serve on any committees for the coming term, beginning this month, we need you to sign up to be a part of our luncheon on January 28th. It'll be in the outback. We'll provide everything, but this is the time for your committee to meet uh, as a committee officially for the very first time for most of you to elect your chairperson. By the way, don't be absent. The tradition is those that don't show up get elected as chairman. So uh, uh, come, plan on coming, fill out that reservation form, meet with your committee, and y'all will determine when you'll meet, how often you'll meet, who will be your chairperson, and there'll be somebody there to explain the responsibilities that your committee has. So important, and <clears throat> we appreciate your service. Well, the best way to get off to a great start is plan on meeting uh, that last Sunday <clears throat> for lunch, and we'll provide it for you. And thank you in advance for doing that. Tear that off, fill it out, tear it off, drop it in the offering plate in the service today so we'll know how many to plan for. All right? Thank you. Dave?
what worship is than how great the glory of our God. Each time we gather for worship, we really gather to say, Lord, I love you. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I recognize all that you are and all that you desire to be in my own life. Brother Jackie oftentimes refers to the things that go on in the week as stuff. And oftentimes the stuff of life can hinder our hearts and hinder our ability to worship. Oftentimes to hinder our desire even to worship. Many of the hymns that we sing are written as a result of the stuff of life. It is well with my soul was written because Horatio Spafford had lost his wife and children in a tragic accident at sea. Many other hymns have been written from those same life experiences. So is the story behind the hymn that you hear John play. B.B. McKinney was a noted church musician of the early 30s and 40s and 50s. In fact, he in his later years of ministry, he served at the Sunday School Board was called then, Lifeway that it's called now, our flagship leadership organization of our convention. He served as the head musician for that organization. Before that role, he was a minister of music, much like I am today. He was serving at the First Baptist Church of Muskogee, Oklahoma, leading in revival services. Hearing the stories of the congregation of those who were struggling and suffering from the stuff of the Great Depression. The Lord pressed upon his heart Sunday night, January the 21st, 1934, that he should write a hymn to encourage the people in his congregation at that revival service. That the Lord's love for us his mercies, His abilities to provide and to care for us have always been and always will be greater than life's stuff. He wrote the words to this hymn while the preacher was preaching that night 
He wrote the music after he got back to the Shivers Hotel in Muskogee, Oklahoma. And in that night, one of the greatest hymns of faith that we sing as a congregation was birthed to encourage us to have faith when all else fails about us, when our prayers go unanswered, when life's stuff interferes with our ability and our desire to recognize the greatness of the glory of our God. We'll sing all four verses today. Have faith in God. It's on page 508. Would you stand? Let's sing together. church. You may be seated. Come on.
feel like the old miner who'd been out mining for months and came into town to the gospel meeting. He hadn't heard singing in months. And he heard the glorious singing of the camp meeting. He turned to a neighbor and said, friend, do me a favor. Hold my mule while I shout. So I just want to tell you, I just feel like having a spell. It's been like an old time revival service this morning. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you, orchestra. What about that orchestra? I'll tell you what, they just sounded good. Give the Lord a hand for all of our musicians, would you? <clears throat> Makes me want to pick up the trumpet again, David. And uh, I, most of you don't know I have a vast musical background. I, our people who come all the time know uh, I took trumpet for two weeks and uh, just realized that it takes somebody a lot sharper than me to be a good musician. So I appreciate good musicians. And I appreciate you and I am so thankful for the privilege of being your pastor and sharing God's word with you. And I want you this morning to know that for the next several weeks, there'll be a couple of passages we share every Sunday. And then we're going to take other verses and tie them together as we continue our series on marks of a healthy church. Marks of a healthy church. You have the worship guide there in front of you and you have the uh, passages that are listed. Let me invite you to go ahead and find, if you put your marker, at Ezekiel chapter 37. Now while you're finding Ezekiel chapter 37, let me ask you to do something for me. And you'll help me with a message this morning. If you're seated on the inside of this aisle here, on my left, your right, or you're here, my right, your left, you'll find a little stack of orange cards. Would you, whether you're a guest or a member, would you pick those up, take one, pass them down, so that everybody on your row has one, and I want to urge everybody to take one. In the, in the middle of the message, you'll find out exactly what this is all about. You can tell pretty much by, by looking at it what it's all about. And I'll give you a, a brief synopsis of it while you're passing those down. On February the 25th of this year, we're having in our church on that Sunday morning, Friend Day. We are asking God to fill our house with friends and neighbors, loved ones, acquaintances, work associates, people you personally know, you personally live with or are related to, who do not go to church anywhere regularly or may or may not know the Lord, you don't know. I've already got in mind the three that I'm going to invite to come and be our guests on that Sunday morning 
And I want to ask, I want to challenge, I want to urge you to take this very seriously. And you'll see why in just a few moments. Junior Hill, our dear friend, a friend of our church, uh, the resident of Hartzell, and really, and I'll tell you that Junior Hill will be known as Southern Baptist, most beloved, most appreciated, most revered evangelist of his lifetime. He is being and has been installed in the Southern Baptist Evangelist Hall of Fame, along with people like Dr. R.G. Lee and others. He will be with us that morning. And if you've ever wanted a loved one who may not know the Lord or may not be in church, to be under the sound of a preacher who has the gift of drawing the net without manipulation, just preaching the simple gospel, we're praying for a great harvest that day. We want you to, to use this card, and I'll tell you in a moment about how important it is for you to write down. This is for you to keep. It's not for us, it's for you to put in your purse, put in your wallet, put in your Bible. Names of at least three people you're going to begin praying for, three people you're going to, if need be, develop a relationship with, minister to, encourage, to the end that in advance of February 25th, you will invite them to come as your guests to Friend Day. Why don't you offer to take them to lunch that day? Uh, why don't you offer to do something special for them just to let them know how important it is for you to have your friends come to be with you that day. And so keep that in mind. We'll remind you of that uh, during the message in just a moment, but it's a very important part of what we'll be doing today. Every week through the next 11 or 12 weeks or so, I'll be sharing that passage out of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. You have it there in front of you. Let me share it with you again and keep your finger on Ezekiel 37. In Matthew 28, that which we have come to know as the Great Commission, Jesus said, and we can't hear it enough, we can't preach it enough, we can't uh, emphasize it enough, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, or some translations, unto the end of the age. And then in front of you there is the passage from Jeremiah chapter 29. You don't need to turn there. Just notice it on your worship guide. God reminding the prophet in chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Their plans for good and not for disaster, some translations say for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And then in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, that wonderful verse that uh, so many people claim, in fact, I know some people who have it tattooed on their neck. Uh, I won't name them, but Libby's son is one of them. Um, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. In all these verses, we're reminded of what it is our Lord wants us to be about. Then we're reminded that God has plans for us that are good. And then we're reminded that God doesn't ask us to do anything, that he doesn't give us the grace and the power to do. And today I want to talk to you about a healthy church particularly along this aspect. A healthy church has a clear vision and a godly attitude. There are only two points to today's sermon. Doesn't that make you glad? Amen? Thank you, some of y'all say amen. But there's a lot between the two points. And so I want you to listen very quickly and listen carefully to see what word God may have for us. Last week, we talked about the purposes of the church. We listed six of them and, and they're there in your worship guide. The purpose of worship, loving people, evangelism and missions, discipleship, ministry, encouragement and exhortation. And today I really want us to focus on what it means to have a clear vision and a godly attitude. 
It hasn't been long, probably three years ago now, that our church implemented a 2020 vision. We elected a 2020 vision committee who spent months looking through our church records, uh, questioning our people, evaluating our strengths and our weaknesses and our needs and our opportunities, our uniqueness as a church, our community needs, and they brought back to our church several things we're gonna be talking about this morning that represent what we believe are the highest priorities of our church for the years between then and the year 2020. Now we know that a vision is always very, very important. No church, no business, no individual will ever reach their highest potential if they don't know where they're going or have a plan on how they're going to get there. And certainly it's true for a church. But to illustrate that, let me read for you Ezekiel chapter 37. There is probably no more famous Old Testament prophecy from Ezekiel than this one. It is in context, God's word of hope to Israel. It's a word of hope about a people that had missed God's best, but God had a plan for them. Listen to God's message through Ezekiel. It's called the vision of the valley of dry bones. The hand of the Lord was upon me, said Ezekiel, and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. And it caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. And lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, that is the voice of God, Son of man, can these bones live? Can this valley of dry, very dry bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. You're the only one who does know. And again he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Then said the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring, a, upon, bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied, said Ezekiel, and I, as I was commanded and I prophesied and as I prophesied there was a noise and behold a shaking and the bones came together, bone to his bone. When I beheld Lo, the sinew and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, and there was, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and the breath came into me and they lived and stood up on their feet an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost and we're cut off from our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, behold, O oh, my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I'm the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O oh, my people, and brought you up out of your graves. And lastly, verse 14, and you shall, and I shall, and shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live and I will place you in your own land, then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, thus saith the Lord God. Thus known as Ezekiel's valley and vision of the valley of dry bones. No more clearer passage can be found in Ezekiel. Of old time, heaven sent revival when God does a new work in the hearts of his people than Ezekiel chapter 37. 
two things this morning that are so important for us to discover our church's greatest potential and to avoid the tendency that so many churches have of declining and decaying because of the lack of a clear vision and a godly attitude. For at least once a year, sometimes two or three times a year, we try to remind ourselves of what our vision of the church is. Let me share with you at least some definitions so that we're on the same page of what we're talking about. What is a clear vision? And by the way, it's the pastor's responsibility. It is my obligation to keep before you that which we as a church have set as our target and our goal and our priorities and our things that we must be committed to. Our vision at Central Park is what we believe that God wants to do through us to accomplish His purposes in us in this place. True success is being what God wants us to be and do, doing to us to be and to do what God wants us to do. Why is this so important? Well, if you have any opportunity to observe churches or individuals or corporations or whatever, uh, other entities out there may have need of growth without a vision, that just doesn't happen. Somebody's defined vision is this, a God-given burden to see a person, a place or a situation and what they could become if the grace of God and the power of God was unleashed or were unleashed upon them. That's really what happened in Ezekiel's Valley of Dry Bones. A vision is what you see and a mission is what you do. Listen to this quote. A godly vision is right for the times. It's right for the church and it's right for the people. A godly vision promotes faith rather than fear. A godly vision motivates people to action. A godly vision requires devoted obedience, faith, and yes, even risk taking. A godly vision glorifies God and builds his church. And I want to leave you, I want to share with you these thoughts to, and ask that the Lord will implant them in our hearts. These, these four simple truths. One, God has a plan for us. God told Jeremiah, I've got a plan to bless you. God's got a plan for the Central Park family. God's got a good plan, a good plan. I don't believe our best days are behind us. I believe our best days can be, should be in front of us if we'll rediscover and reaffirm God's plan for our church. By the way, the message of the church never changes. We don't compromise the message to water down the word where it's not offensive to anybody. We just preach the word, let the chips fall where they may. The gospel message is not going to be diluted, but the methods change. The methods change. I'll tell you something I thought about doing. I, I really don't think I'll do it, but uh, uh, I, I considered it. I thought about coming out here one Sunday morning after I welcome you, go back to the back and change clothes. I thought about coming out here in a pair of holy blue jeans. Now don't y'all look so spiritual, you see them all the time. Some of you wear them all the time. Can't afford those that don't have holes in them. The ones with holes cost more anyway. I thought about getting some moose, not a moose, some moose, and spiking my hair. <laughs> y'all getting the picture? And I thought about getting me a little bitty stool down here, sturdy but small, and sitting on a stool. And I thought about preaching with spiked hair and raggedy jeans from a stool here in the front. Now why in the world, preacher, would you do that? Because it's all right. It's all right. You see, not everybody wears a suit when they preach. Not everybody's comfortable with that. Not everybody uh, is comfortable with a, a large, gorgeous, beautiful pulpit. We've got one of the most beautiful pulpits in the country, but some folks, that's not their thing. So what I'm saying is this, God's got plans. God's plans are good. And the message never changes. 
But we as a church must be willing to adapt our methods. The 1950s methods will not reach a 21st century generation. And we're going to find a lot of things about what millennials are looking for. And they're looking for life application, practical truth. They're wanting to be involved in missions and ministry. They want authentic Christian living from authentic believers. They want role models that point them to Jesus. They want to feel like they're making a significant contribution to our, to our world through the church. And they want a church that has a vision for the world. God's plan is a good plan. We have a choice. Every church comes to a crossroad. Every church comes to a place where we decide whether we're going to go forward or whether we're going to go backwards. God's word to Ezekiel was, let Israel move forward, good days are ahead. And the truth is that the negative aspect is the absence of a vision almost always results in spiritual decline. But the presence and pursuit of a clear vision bring spiritual vitality, victory, and revival. May I remind you of what you already know. May I remind you of the four things that are the top priorities of Central Park Baptist Church as determined by your lay leadership, by your church vote, by your affirmation over the past several years. What are our clear priorities? Number one, is to lead our church to become outward focused. Someone has said, and I remember Dave Whitten bringing this quote to my attention. The real measure of the success of a church is not its seating capacity. But Dave, remember what you said? It's sending capacity. And so our vision as a church is, Lord, Move us from outside of these beautiful, gorgeous walls, these beautiful windows and these beautiful lights, and this beautiful, gorgeous sanctuary where we have the privilege of worshiping. Uh, move us, Lord, because we want to understand the work of the church is not done primarily here. Here we teach, here we evangelize, here we disciple, here we minister. But we here we get ready to do most of that. And it's out there in the classroom, in the marketplace, in the business, in your neighborhood. That's where the gospel is really shared. And our goal as a church was to build a mentality in our church where we would lead our church to become outward focused, more missional and less attractional. It's all right to say y'all come. It's all right to say, we'd love for you to come to our church. But mission says, we're going to come to you with backpacks for children. We're going to come to you with disaster relief. We're going to come to you with grief recovery. We're going to come to you with ministry because we believe the purpose of the church is not to wait for the lost people. By the way, the day used to be, you could announce church, you could announce a revival, and folks would just come, they'd just come. And that day's over. People aren't like that anymore. And so unless we become outwardly focused, we will not discover some of the greatest blessings of God's vision for our church. Vision number two, to lead our church to become outwardly focused, to lead our church to invest and invite. Here we go, find your card, will you? Now may I, may I be real, Gut level, that's a Greek term. Gut level honest. We're not doing this nearly as much. Let me tell you why. Invest and invite means that I always have my sights set on people that I can build a relationship with. This is not an ulterior motive. It's the gospel. That I might build a relationship with them. That I might uh, get their confidence that I might have the opportunity to ultimately share the gospel, my story, the, what I was before Christ, how I found Christ, how he's changed me, how he can change them. But most of our friends are Christians. Most of our friends are class members. Most of our friends are church buddies. Now there's nothing wrong with that. But what I'm saying is we have got to become intentional 
that we might develop an invest and invite mindset. We don't have that nearly enough. We've got a wonderful fellowship. We've got great leadership. We've got some of the most mature people I've ever pastored in my whole ministry. But the truth is, most of us are so blessed by our fellowship that we haven't intentionally focused on finding, locating, and building relationships with lost people. So I want to challenge you this morning to rediscover the vision that we voted to adopt for our church. And that is, embrace a mindset that says we're going to develop an invest and invite mindset. And every Sunday for the next 12 weeks, you're going to say, or for the next however many weeks there are, uh, not that many between now and February 25th, you're going to see something reminding us about this part of our goal as a church. Our clear goal to invest, invite, to become outwardly focused. Number three, uh, to make ministry to children one of our highest priorities. I'm so grateful for the backpacks that we carry to schools. I'm so grateful for the, the, the ministry to our Austin High School football team. And they're not children, they're almost grown, but that's a part of our ministry extension of our church. I'm grateful for our child care ministry. And this is what we've said. If we can reach the children, we can reach the families. I believe we need to raise the bar. I've challenged our, our staff for the last few years to do vacation Bible schools or our backyard Bible schools in our community. All around our community are people of different ethnic backgrounds. All around our community are people who don't go to church anywhere. And whether it's a backyard Bible school or, or some other creative way of ministry, we want to focus on ministering to children. We want to include what we've done in the past is include their visibility in the services, have them sing more often. Have you noticed something? When the children sing in the service, have you noticed something? There's always a noticeably, a noticeably, in, a noticeable increase in our attendance. Why? Because mamas and daddies want to come and hear their little children sing. And some of those mom and daddies aren't going to church anywhere, and some of them may not know the Lord. So when you invest in children, you plant the seed for reaching parents. And then number four, there were a lot of other things we did, but these top four things are a part of a clear vision. Become outwardly focused, missional rather than attractional. Develop and invest and invite mindset for our unchurched and lost friends. To lead our church to make ministry to children one of our highest priorities. And number four, to lead our church to create new entry points to our church through various small groups and an alternative worship service. At the time that we approved our 2020 vision, we were studying what a, an alternative worship service might look like. A, another time, another style. Uh, we looked at the possibility of having another service simultaneously in the outback and having it podcast or whatever you call it from here to there. Uh, simulcast, thank you. And we looked at all, the, that is the one area we have done the least in. Uh, we, we've got to do a better job of creating entry points. Let me tell you what I mean. Anybody who comes in the doors of this church, no matter their age or their marital status or where they are along the plateau of their spiritual journey, we ought to have a Bible study group, an entry group, a small group or something where we can plug them in where people can minister to them where they are. And that's probably the one area of our vision that we have uh, done the least in but need to do much, much, much more. So I want us to stay focused and understanding a clear vision for the future. But Brother Jackie, what is it that helps us to accomplish those visions. By the way, we've done some of these things. We have created new units. We have, uh, we have tried in other ways uh, to find new ways where people can, can find in, an entry way into the life of our church and be blessed. We just simply need to raise that bar and uh, 
By the way, will you listen real carefully? When you hear terms like, we need to start a new class, don't say, no! Excuse me. I was just quoting some other members of our church. No! Oh, don't say that. Or, let's have a class that meets on Tuesday night in somebody's home. Now, how novel is that? Or, or let's have a, let's have a, a class and it's some other place, some other time this Sunday morning. What I'm saying is, we have got to be willing to embrace new methods in order to reach the world beginning at our doorstep for Christ. Amen? amen. I'm glad you said amen because I'm, I'm fixing to get to the good part. Point number two, my last sermon point. <laughs> Healthy churches are marked by a clear vision and a healthy attitude. <laughs> a healthy attitude. Would you let me tell you a little story and I know I've told it before, but it's so good. I, I just like to hear myself tell it again. About the old boy stranded on the desert island. Been there for years. And the rescuers found him. He said, I'm so glad you found me. I've been here for years. I thought nobody would ever find me. We're glad we found you, said the rescuers, but can you explain something to us? There are three buildings on this island. You're deserted. It's you by yourself. Why? Oh, well, there are three buildings. He said, oh, that's easy. That's easy. The one hut over there, that's where I live. That's my house. See that church, that, that building over there, that's my church. That's where I go to church. That third building is where I used to go to church before I got mad and moved my membership. <laughs> Attitude's everything. So I want to talk to you for just a moment, just a moment, give me just a moment about some attitudes that make a difference in a healthy church. First of all, an attitude that is marked by enthusiasm. Did you know that the word enthusiasm comes from a Greek word, in theos, the preposition in, and theos, God, full of God, enthusiasm. Man, we ought to sing with enthusiasm. We ought to teach with enthusiasm. We ought to minister with enthusiasm. We ought to serve with enthusiasm. Monday night at our house, there were seven of us there gathered around the television watching a football game. And don't y'all look so spiritual? Most of y'all, well, maybe some of you weren't, but some of, most of you were watching the game too. And I'll tell you, every person in that room is normally quiet, normally reserved, normally pretty well behaved. But may I tell you, when that backup quarterback for Alabama threw that pass in the end zone and in overtime won the national championship, our household turned into a Pentecostal camp meeting. I could have sworn I heard somebody speaking in tongues. I'm telling you, they were having a spell. In fact, it was so good, Libby jumped up and said, I believe I'm gonna give somebody a kiss. And I got in line. I mean, uh, I said, throw another pass, throw another pass. Why? What in the world causes people to get enthusiastic, excited about something? And listen, folks. We've got to get excited about the gospel and excited about what God can do and excited about how God wants to use us and enthusiasm ought to mark our attitude as a church. But not only mark my enthusiasm. <laughs> a healthy church is marked by an attitude that believes God can. Believes God can. You've heard me say this before. God can do exceedingly abundantly more than we ask or think. I can tell you of church after church after church that God did a work in that church and it was like a valley of dry bones in Ezekiel's day and revival came and stirred the people of God and God did something that was remarkable in, in breathing new life into that church. What attitude is it that God honors? God can. Listen, 
God can do exceedingly abundantly more than we ask or think. God can heal a marriage. God can restore a backslider. God can forgive a believer who's made a terrible, terrible mistake and made horrible decisions. God can save the most vile lost man, lost woman. God can send revival to Central Park Baptist Church. God can send revival to Decatur. God can send revival to, the, to Alabama and to our country. God can, but it's fire starts somewhere. And may there be a church in Decatur, Alabama where the people of God leave out of their vocabulary. We can't do that if it's of the Lord. But we believe God can do exceedingly abundantly more than we ask or think. The third attitude is we must be willing to do, quote, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Being God's people is not just about me being comfortable. It's not just about doing things the way they've always been done. Listen, folks, changes are coming. I'm not sure exactly what kind of change, but I'll tell you, it's coming and it's all right. And I think that the attitude that says, Lord, whatever it takes to reach people, I'm okay with it. I'm okay because it's not just about me, it's about the kingdom of heaven. Would you be willing in your heart today to say, Lord, whatever it takes for me to help our church become everything you want her to be, I'm willing to do it. And one last word, then added to you that God blesses, you can count on me. You can count on me. You can and I can be comfortable with becoming simply an occupant of a pew. Or we can say, Lord, use me. Use me to teach a class. Use me to be a part of a Bible study group. Use me to be a servant in an area of ministry. Use me. If you're a senior adult, God can still use you in a wonderful way. If you're one of our youngest members, God can use you. There's a place of service for you in the family of faith that'll make a difference in this church's ministries. This little story and I'm done. Church League Basketball. Bartlett, Tennessee. We had 20 six baseball teams. I don't know how many basketball teams they had. On the little boy's team that our youngest son, Joey, played on, there's a little boy named Richie. <laughs> Maybe he's laughing because she knows where I'm going to this one. Richie couldn't play very well. He wasn't the best player. He wasn't the best dribbler. He wasn't the best shooter. He wasn't the best ball passer. But he, had, he wanted to play. And Jim... Every game, I could hear him if I was sitting close. He'd say, put me in, coach. Put me in. Put me in. <laughs> and finally, the coach put me in because he got tired of hearing it. I said, Lord, give us a church full of people. I say, put me in, Lord. Help me find a place to plug up and plug in and help our church to discover what it means to be a healthy, vibrant, alive body of Christ. I made this quote years ago. I'll say it again. A deacon came to me in Town Creek, Alabama. Pastor, I found this clipping in the paper. I thought you'd like to read it. And it was out of an article in the paper, in the Florence paper, about religion, about churches. It had a quote. If every member of my church were just like me, what kind of church would my church be? 
if every member of my church gave like me, prayed like me, attended like me, served like me, lived like me, what kind of a church would my church be? God make us a healthy, healthier, happier, holier, more God-honoring church. Would you bow with me, please? Lord, we want to be the bride of Christ that brings you honor and glory. And I thank you for a church that gives faithfully and supports missions and teaches children and feeds high schoolers breakfast during the football season, gets up early to do it. And thank you for people who teach and keep the nursery and teach Sunday school and serve as greeters and ushers and serve on committees and deacons that are willing to be examples and leaders and a staff that devotedly serve you. Thank you for our people. But oh God, would you show us what it is that you really want to do in our midst? Would you do a deep, deep transforming spiritual work that would cause the embers that are glowing to catch on fire? And may this body of Christ be so full of God, that enthusiasm for the things of God, that people will come just to see what's happening. And Lord, if there's a believer here this morning who just needs to come and rededicate his or her life to Christ, starting over, saying, Lord, you can count on me, I pray they'll come. If there's somebody here who's lost, has never given their heart and life to Christ, may they come and let us point them to Christ and tell them how they can be saved by turning from sin and by faith turning to Christ. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, in a moment we're going to stand to our feet. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. If there's a spiritual need in your life, we can help you with. You come to me, we'll pray with you, and there are others here who can minister to you. But I told you something last Sunday I want to remind you of now. This is the time for an altar call. We need to pray for our pastor search committee. You need to pray earnestly and diligently for wisdom for them. And I'm going to ask a number of you to leave your seats in a moment and come in this altar. And if everything is right with you and God, just pray for your pastor search committee. Pray for your pulpit supply committee. Is there a charge with finding those people to preach, fill the pulpit after Easter? Pray. And then you may, while you're in the altar, simply say, God, here am I, send me. Whatever it takes, you can count on me. Make us the kind of healthy church that honors Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. Would you stand together with me, please? The altar is open. The invitation is for you, whatever your spiritual need may be, as we begin to sing, I want you to lead the way as God may be speaking to your heart. Let's sing it, Brother David. Come on. All to Jesus I surrender All to Him I freely the deacons is for Sunday school teachers. I will ever love and trust Him In His presence daily It's time to get on our face before God. Say, God, we need you. God, we need you.
as the invitation continues. Several are in the altar. Not everybody who responds does so publicly. But there's a way for you to respond so we'll know how to pray for you. How we can minister to you on your, in your worship guide on the far right hand side is a perforated section. There's a place you can tell us about your spiritual decision, your spiritual question, your spiritual needs. You've got time now if you've not done so already. Just quietly tear that off. Give us your contact information. Tell us how we can pray for you. And as members of our church who are here week after week, tell us how we can pray for you. Use me, Jesus. Use me now. Gentlemen, if you come, we'll worship the Lord for giving. Friend, Bucky Brown, lead us, brother, as we pray together. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this day. Father, thank you for all these that have gathered this morning, Father, to hear your word. Father, we just pray this morning for those in need, Father, those that just simply need your strength, Father, and those that need your healing, Father. Father, we just thank you for hearing each and every one of our prayers, Father. We just pray now that you'll take these tithes and offerings and use them for your glory. For we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.
people said. And hey, give the Lord a hand. If you have not picked up a questionnaire that our pastor search committee has prepared for each of you to fill out, uh, it's kind of a questionnaire. They're on the back. There's a box. You can fold them up when you finished and uh, put one in there. And we'd love to hear from you. I don't often do this, but because of the nature of the need, please pray, please pray for uh, Joyce and Frank Finley. Uh, Frank was having some heart issues this week, has been in the hospital. She, uh, Joyce fell and broke her shoulder while they were trying to get him to the ambulance. And so pray for them. Pray for Thomas and Charlotte Holiday, some of our newest members. Uh, he has uh, been very, very sick in and out of the hospital. She now is home with the flu, which she probably contracted in the ER at the hospital. But especially remember Buddy and Jane Feehan. Hospice told Jane yesterday that Buddy just has hours, it looks like, on this earth. Some of the sweetest, godliest people in our church, most faithful to our choirs, and, and some of David's closest friends. Pray for them. A lot of our people are sick. A lot of people are having terrible times with the flu. Pray for them. If there's somebody in your class that you've been missing, call and check on them, especially the elderly, and be sure that they're all right, would you? I pray the Lord will give you a great day. I love you. I'm so proud of you, and I thank the Lord for every one of you guests. Please come back and be with us again. Let's stand together, shall we? Sweet Libby and I will be at the back, but let's sing our way out. With the he cannot fail. He must prevail. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.